God. Let me see. We're having some issues. This is tea time. Yeah. Making a difference. One cup at a time. Tea time. Yeah. This is tea time. Yeah. Making a difference. One cup at a time. Tea time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Tea time. Making a difference, one cup at a time. Tea time, yeah. Tea time, time, time. Well, welcome to Tea Time. Yes, there was a little glitch at the beginning of the uh, of the series uh, of today's episode. Uh, so you got to see Miss Liz before you got to see the intro. So that's just a, a little twist, twist to tea today. So before we get started today, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Ring that little doorbell and then you can see all of these incredible tea times anytime in the morning, afternoon, evening, in your home, in your car, on a trip, uh, in an airport, if you're stuck. So you can listen to tea time at any time. What does Miss Liz? Miss Liz offer you? Well, I offer you over 300 plus interviews with incredible individuals from across the globe. Uh, so you can stay and you can check that out uh, in the comfort of your own home or anytime you wish. So let's get started with the disclaimer and then some bio and then we're going to get Audrey Gale in here. And we're going to talk about timely, energetic, ambitious. That's right, the tea that we are serving today. And we're going to be talking about a lot of uh, incredible things, including her book called The Human Trial. And we're going to be talking about that. So grab your tea, grab your coffee, grab your wine, whatever you choose to drink. You do not have to drink tea to enjoy tea time with Miss Liz. So let's get started with the disclaimer for Miss Liz's tea time live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any tea time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, it may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and will see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea time shows are hosted on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you see a tea time on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a rescheduled special or surprise tea time that Miss Liz is bringing to the table. So now a little bit about my guest. Well, who is my guest? Well, Audrey Gale long dreamed of being a writer, but never anticipated the circus cir cir road. I'm, I know I'm not saying that right. She she took she took to get to, to get there. After 20 plus years in the banking industry, she grew up tired of corporate game, game manship and pursued her master's in fiction writing at the University of Southern California. Her first no novel, a legal thriller entitled The Sausage Maker's Daughter, was published under the name A.G.S. Johnson. The novel explored one woman's struggle to find her place amidst the unheaval of the, the radical 1960s. Her second book, The Human Trial, is, is the first book in a medical thriller tri trilogy inspired by Gail's own experience with the gap between traditional medicine and approach, approaches based on the findings of the great psychic, uh, physics of the 20th century. Like Einstein and Bohr, both the sausage maker daughter and the human trial incorporate Gail's fascination with historical and scientific research and always with women finding their places. Let me get Gail in here and let's spill some tea together. Uh, Audrey in here. <laughs> Good afternoon, Audrey. <laughs> Good afternoon to you. 
<laughs> so Audrey, let's get started with who was Audrey as a little girl and who is Audrey now? Audrey as a little girl and Audrey now? Um, Audrey as a little girl, let's see. Well, I think the relevant pieces of that, I'm the fourth out of five women in one family. I have four sisters. And um, I remember as a child telling my little sister that I was going to be writing books someday. And uh, I even had titles going and so on and so forth. So I think I always had in the back of my mind the sense that I would become in some way associated with writing and publishing. And I have. It's miraculous what you put in your brain and it manifests over time. Um, but I did take a circuitous route. My circuitous route involved the fact that there were five girls in my household and my mom. But it was kind of like a dorm floor most of the time, except when my dad came home. My dad came home and everything changed. And like we had to take the clips and the bobby pins out of our hair and we had to come down neatly and, you know, done for dinner at, with dad. And I adored my dad, by the way. I don't want to in any way sound like, you know, I had great resentment toward him. But I had great curiosity about what did he do when he left the house that made him so much more important than the other six of us. So my circuitous route involved me getting an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's in business. So when I left home to go to college, I, I studied business and I entered the corporate world and I really liked it for a while. It, it, it's, you know, I, I think the great thing about stepping out for the first time is really finding out who you are and who you attract and who you repel and what you can do, things you didn't think ever you were able to do. And um, and so I did that for uh, 21 years. And then I just suddenly one day it was enough already. It was over. The corporate gamesmanship can be pretty nasty. Um, fighting over money and power and position and title and, you know, and I just had had it. So I was in the fortunate position of going back to school. And I did go back to the University of Southern California here in L.A., and I got my master's degree in writing. And to graduate, I had to write a novel. And that was my first, ultimately, it was my first published novel called The Sausage Maker's Daughters by A.G.S. Johnson. And it's, um, it was a little more biographical than, than things I aspire to write. Because it was about sibling rivalry, which I'm kind of an expert on. And it was about growing up in the 60s, which I got to revisit as a radical and as a traditional. And um, and it was just such fun to write, such fun to write. And it was a legal thriller. And I happened to have a good friend who was a superior court judge here in Los Angeles. And he read it and he was so complimentary. I thought, uh oh, did you just go black or did something's going on. My screen just went black. Anyway, you're back. So anyway, so that was my first book and I have been writing ever since. So that's who so, I am. <laughs> so Audrey, how did you get the name of the first book? Um, it was a little bit of a tongue in cheek nod to Wisconsin, where, which is where I grew up. And uh, Milwaukee is a very much kind of Germanic Polish, there's big populations. Um, and there's a lot of big sausage companies in Milwaukee. And, and so it was, so as I was thinking about the characters, the, the father in the novel owns a, uh, a big farm, a rendering farm where he makes, raises animals and makes sausages out of them. So that was, uh, it was just kind of, I, I tend to do things that amuse me. They may not amuse anyone else, but it amused me. <laughs> and well, I think I'm thinking of the Sibiri robbery, right? And the sausage, like who gets the last sausage, right? Like, 
I, I was back in Milwaukee seeing one of my sisters, you know, uh, right about the time the sausage maker's daughters came out. And we went to one of those old, famous old German restaurants in downtown Milwaukee that specialize in you know, German beers and sausages. And, and it just, it just felt like part of home. So do you have some Polish background? I certainly do. I am, um, I, my father is 100% Polish, first generation born here. Um, his, both of his parents came from nearby to the Krakow area in Poland. And I don't know why, and I can't really explain it, but I really do identify with the Polish side so much more than my mom's side, which was Scotch, Irish, English. Um, uh, I, I don't know what it is, but I've been, I've just, I think maybe because I identify so closely with my dad. My dad was a mystic engineer. <laughs> and so I kind of have his weird curiosity about things. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes right into the, the, the book that you just came out with, The Human Trial, right? It's all of the understanding the physics of medicine and all of that good stuff as well, right? Yeah, it was, it, you know, I, I think writing is a pretty hard job. You better like research a lot, even if you're writing contemporaneously. You know, you, you, you have to get everything right. You have to get, what are they listening to? What are they seeing? What are they wearing? What are they eating? What are they drinking? Um, what's going on in the greater world? So research is an essential part. And um, so I had to do a deep dive into the 60s, although I had lived through the 60s. I didn't live it in a conscious way. I was a little bit younger than, you know, 1968 when all hell broke loose all over the world. Um, so I had to revisit all of that. But anyway, um, that brings me to loving research brings me to the human trial the human trial was certainly ambitious for me because as you know i don't have a degree in medicine or physics i'm not a great scientist in background either um, but i'd had three personal experiences that kept slapping me the universe was slapping me and saying pay attention pay attention pay attention and it was making me think long and hard about how we approach health and disease. Um, and so I, I started out having a very nasty illness in my mid thirties, which no specialist of Western medicine could even touch. And I really thought I was dying of leukemia or lymphoma or something. And, um, and so a friend of mine took me to his acupuncturist in Oakland, California. It was across the bay from where I was living and working then, which was San Francisco. And, um, and it was an overnight sensation. I'd had these terrible swollen lymph glands all over my body, visible, painful. Um, tried everything Western medicine could throw at me. And overnight acupuncture and um, herbal medicine absolutely began to cure me and cured me rapidly. So that was the first slap. The second slap was when I moved to Los Angeles, my dog, a 13 year old golden retriever seemed to have, she had something, I don't know if it was similar. I don't know if it was lymph related, but she had kind of a swelling and oozing and she was very ill. And I didn't have a vet, so I went to multiple vets because every single vet I went to said, oh, she's 13 years old, she's a big dog, she's had a long life, just put her down. Well, okay, I, I, I just couldn't do it because I didn't have any friends in Los Angeles and she was it. So I mean, I wanted to try one more thing and I found a, a holistic vet. And that vet really changed my life. Not only did he save the life of my dog, and do a lot of really weird looking things that I could question and he would explain to me. But he turned me on to the original scientists that I researched and, um, and I kind of casually researching it at the time. 
until the final slap from the universe. My dad was diagnosed with leukemia. And he came to my house after his first and last chemotherapy treatment. And he said, I don't care, Audrey. I don't care. I'd rather die. I'm not doing that again. So I cheekily said to him, well, I know you haven't asked me, Dad, but if you ask me what I think you should do, I would take you to my vet. <laughs> and, you, know, <laughs> you know, my dad, you got to love the guy. He said, well, what have I got to lose? Well, he wanted a little explanation, but which I gave him, but what have I got to lose? And so it was my vet that cured my dad of leukemia. And the way wow. he did that was he made a cassette recording of sounds. It was just vibrations, just sounds in the audible audio spectrum at, at, at certain vibration rates. And what he, what the vet explained to me was he did not have the sophisticated equipment of the original scientists that I studied who worked in the twenties and thirties, but he could through something in physics called harmonics, he could, sp oh my gosh, there you go again. Are you there? Uh, yep, yeah, I'm here. My screen keeps going black and then comes back. Oh my gosh, it's very uh, uh, rattling. Anyway, he explained that the, um, the vibration rate of the disease could be stepped down by harmonics, by stepping down by octaves on a piano. And so that's what the sounds were that he made of. But I should probably take just a quick step back and explain that what the scientists found was that disease microbes, if you can look at them in their living state, which they could, and it's very difficult to do, and it's not a lot of people can do it today, um, they discovered that each disease had a specific frequency. The microbes of the disease had a specific frequency and they discovered also that um, if they could replicate that frequency and just let it wash over the diseased body, um, it killed all the disease microbes. It overwhelmed them and overwhelming them with energy caused them eventually to change shape and cell function and they died. And the good news was nothing else was touched. So everything else in a, in a diseased body would be left as is just your disease would be eradicated. So that's what happened with my dad. My dad went back to his acupuncture, uh, excuse me, his, his internist, his MDs and said, and they expected the worst because he'd refused chemo and they found that he had quote unquote, the damnedest case, of spontaneous remission they had ever seen. Wow. And so you can't tell him that the vet cured him. The vet would have been arrested or heavily fined or who knows what. But since then, the vet has died. He was, he was quite elderly when I met him. He died. And my dad eventually died some years later of pneumonia. Wow. So I got those slaps from the universe and I finally paid attention. Well, let, let's talk about good vibrations and frequencies because I, a lot of my listeners are interested in, in sounds and frequencies and that out there. Uh, so have you used them to cure yourself for for different illnesses as well, Padre? Well, I, I did buy, I went to a conference on all of this um, in 2016 and I met the head of a company in Canada, actually the other side of Canada, I think on the west, western edge, who, whose husband was an early experimenter with, with this kind of vibrational healing. And he was a scientist and I don't know what else. I think he was also an engineer. And he created a machine and uh, that could replicate frequencies. And so that's exactly what the early scientists were doing and with different kinds of equipment, of course, but um, I bought that machine and um, I 
have to say that I have been incredibly healthy. So I haven't had to use it a lot, but I do every now and again, just maybe this is the reason I just sit down and boost my immune system. I think that is the secret to health. Your body is so complex. It is so complex that nothing that man could dream of could address all the things that are happening. You have 40 trillion cells in your body and they are having 1 billion interactions every single second. So it's just, it's just mind boggling. You just can't possibly get your arms around just those numbers, let alone if something's breaking down, how to address a billion interactions a second and so forth. So um, what I like about the machine is it does have settings for like, you know, sleep. It has all the diseases, it, regardless, all the diseases. But it has, you know, improve your sleep, imp boost your immune. And those are the kind of things that I've used it for. Yeah. Because I use a lot of the frequencies that are on YouTube for sleeping and the sounds and music. Some of them are it's like rain, water, and uh, you know, like white noises and that. Uh, uh -huh. So, uh -huh. have you used any of those, Audrey? Excuse me, I needed a little sip. Um, no, I haven't done that, but I, I, you know, it's like it's like spa music. It's like massage music. It, it, it's like things that just kind of, I, I think they help align your, your energy, you know, or acupuncture believes in meridians, which I believe can be detected through electrical detection equipment today. And so there's these electrical flows, there's energetic flows passing through your body at all times. And so I think Sound vibrations, like what you're mentioning, Miss Liz, I, I, I think that that's exactly what it's doing. It's just aligning your energy. And you find yourself kind of peaceful, calmer. Well, it, it helps me sleep. Yeah, of course. You know, when it's... I first started, I was like, oh, my God, this noise is going to keep me awake all the time. But I, it actually put me to sleep. And I've been sleeping better since I've been starting to use that. Uh, and then there's also ones for healing the body and that when you're sleeping, because your body heals when you're sleeping as well. Uh, it does. Guess, so. It does. It does indeed. That's when it, you know, restores everything. That sleep is important. So, Audrey, how did you come up with the title, The Human Trial? So, um, I love suspenseful stories. Um I love writing suspenseful stories. I love a story that grabs me and catches me and pulls me through. And I also love a story that teaches me things when I'm not even realizing that I'm learning. Um, so that was my that was my hope with this book, The Human Trial. So my protagonist is a pathologist. He comes from a rough background. He is brilliant. He gets through, all the way through Harvard on scholarship. He gets a pathology specialist and he meets another scientist at Harvard in the medical lab who is developing a very powerful and unique light microscope, which is now all of that is kind of reflective of who the real scientists were. There was an incredible discovery in terms of microscopy and then there was this discovery of disease vibrations and healthy vibrations so all of that was going back to the scientists and then um in my story i have the two guys work work working on what they're discovering these live microbes that they can see with this microscope and then they discover the unique signature frequencies of each disease. And then they discover that e those frequencies will actually eradicate the disease and leave everything else healthy and in place. So, um, so I, I built the story around that. It, it, was it was very important to me that I, I give the science as good an airing as I was capable of, but I, I wanted it to be plain English. 
and that was <laughs> quite a challenge. But I did. I had a very good friend who is a pretty. He was a pretty important physicist here in Los Angeles. He taught space physics at UCLA, whatever that means. And I have another very good friend here who is a pathologist and has multiple labs and let me come to his lab and see through his microscopes and see how they, you know, determine what to do with a disease or how they determine how to cure a disease. Anyway, I had expert ad advisors all the way along, but I said to both of them, um, nobody understands what you're talking about. So my job is to take what you're telling me and put it in plain English and I'd have to play it back to them. <laughs> I, I can't believe they didn't laugh me out of the room, but they were very patient and very kind and very generous. And we eventually got where, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, that, that pretty much says it. I'd like it to be more specific because I'm a scientist, but yeah, I think you've got it. So that is also informed the writing of the book. And so um, the gist of the book, the, the gist of the suspense, the building suspense is that they discover this incredible thing about disease, these microbes and their signature frequencies and, and what you can do with that frequency to cure the disease. And they were working along expecting, you know, a, a Pulitzer Prize or a Nobel Prize or, you know. However, it was during the depression I, I used the depression as an additional pressure and they soon came up against great resistance from the medical establishment. And I think as soon as you say the word establishment, I think you have to know that this entity, whatever that establishment represents is interested in the status quo. They will protect the status quo. They don't want a lot of changes that might make make their lives better or worse. They just want to they want to they want to be in control of that. And so, again, that reflects what was happening in the 30s in particular. So that's the gist of the story. They come into tremendous conflict with the medical establishment, much to their surprise. And it goes from there. You know, back in the day, they didn't want to rock the boat either, right? They didn't want to have that, uh, you know, that tippy water to go on. Uh, you know, and sci I feel you know, for scientists out there, it's it's a hard job because it's to prove the facts, right? To bring the facts to the table. And like you said, to put it in plain English, like to try and explain that this molecule, uh, this mo uh, molecule does this and, and, you know, moves and and. So did you find something interesting when you seen the microscopes? Like, did, were you at all when you were looking through that? No, because um, here's what happened to the real scientists. They were discredited. Uh, their lives ended badly. And all the microscopes and all their research was suppressed. Oh. It has not, it has not been, it has yet to come to full recognition and light. Um, it, it, there is a growing wave of people, like you said, Miss Liz, about your, your audience using vibration in various ways. There, there, is a, there is a growing wave of people saying something, I don't think it takes a scientist to tell you that something is wrong with our medical system. It is so expensive. It is completely chemically oriented uh, drugs, which um, generally have pretty nasty side effects, but the, the word cure is rarely used. Words like remission is what we hear in Western medicine today. And so we all have a sense of how can this really be? This, this doesn't seem right. It doesn't yeah. seem right. And so um, the suppression was very uh, violent and final. And so my, <laughs> my thought about writing this book was um, I just wanted, I wanted to air what was out there at the time and what is still out there, but sort of under the radar and what is coming 
I, I truly believe what is coming. It's, it's when I say the gap between uh, physicists like Einstein and Bohr and, and modern medicine, I mean that the physicists proved starting in 1905 that there is nothing solid in the universe, that everything, everything at its most fundamental level, my desk, you and me, etc., is vibrating energy. It's vibrating energy. And so that to me suggests that that should be a fundamental aspect of our health and our disease. Something gets out of whack in our symphonic vibrations. You know, you talked about how calming music can be and vibrations can be. It is like a symphony finally coming into perfect coordination. Everyone knowing their part, when to come in, when to leave, when to be silent, when to play, and supporting each other through this beautiful symphony. And that has kind of occurred to me as maybe that describes health in a really profound way. So, Audrey, I want to ask you a question. How do you feel about self-advocating for your medical uh, health care? Self-advocating. You mean, uh, uh, do you mean like calling the doctors to task? What are you, what are you, you know, asking for details? Like self-advocating, like, because we talk about medication, right? They're so fast to push the medication on us without understanding what's causing the illness or the, the disease. Uh, uh -huh. You turn to holistic, right? You turn to the vet and the vet was able to cure your father and your dog. Uh, how do you feel about reaching out to those holistic uh, individuals in that? Like, do you feel that that should be a choice that we all have or that we should be looking into? I, I think the number one question or the number one answer to your question is you have to take responsibility for yourself. You must, it is essential. And what I tell people as a takeaway when I'm talking about my book is, um, you, you, you need to consult all the experts that you think are rele relevant and question, 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 question authority. Let's go back to the 60s. Question authority. Um, you, you it's essential that you go outside the box. When I recently had a little um, intestinal issue, I went to the homeopathic drugstore in Santa Monica and I, I called my doctor's office and my doctor's office prescribed drugs. And I said, I don't want those. I don't want drugs. So I had, I put that aside and I did what the homeopath recommended. And it was again, you know, just, it, it's so quick. It's so easy. It's so cheap. And so, so here's the thing you need to remember about your doctors. I love my doctor and she is fabulous, but the drug companies, the big, huge pharm pharmaceuticals, the big pharma, they contribute to almost every single medical school you can name. Yeah. They yeah. influence the education that our doctors are getting. And they also influence the regulatory agencies in our government that says, you have to use this, you have to use that. This is the common practice. This is standard care. You, you have to recognize that maybe some of the things you're looking into, they've never been exposed to. And, and, and even worse, they've been told it's just a bunch of hooey. And, and so that's why I say you must be responsible. You must be responsible. Well, it goes right back to self-advocating and, and taking responsibility, you know, and questioning the authority. Just because we're told it's this way doesn't mean that we can't say, well, can we do it this way? You know, there's got to be a different way, right? There's a path. There's a left and a right. It doesn't always have to be the right side. You know, we can always go to the left side. Um, right. You know, right. I, I think it's deeply important, like for my listeners out there as well, they know that Miss Liz is big on advocating, uh, you know, and taking responsibility for our lives and self-care. Uh, you know, sometimes the doctors don't have the answers. 
because like you said, Audrey, they're being, they're being taught a certain way, right? That they have to prescribe that medicine or that's the best medicine uh, or they get paid for a certain medicine if it's prescribed, you know, there, mm. there's bonuses and hidden stuff like that as well. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm really glad that we're talking about this at the, today on the table. So, so I, I am too, I am too, because, because it, 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 it has to change. The, the, I, I have a wonderful article written by Dr. John Abramson, who's an MD at Harvard, who says the only place in government where there's complete um, agreement on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, is taking big money from big pharma. pharma. And so everybody's in everybody's pocket there there's it just nothing but conflicts of interest out here and that's why you have to be the responsible party and i also believe nobody knows what's going on with you in your body and your mind in your heart better than you so yep. take that knowledge Absolutely. and ask away <laughs> and, and i say it all the time right You're, nobody knows your body better than you if you, if the doctor says, oh, your tests are all coming back normal and there's still something not feeling right in your gut, there's something off in your body. Your body is speaking to you and telling you, I need to be, I need healing. I need some form of uh, time, rest, you know, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. there's uh -huh. so many different things that our bodies talk to us. And sometimes we don't listen to our bodies, right? We're just like, oh, well, we'll, we'll go to the doctor because the doctor has the answer. Well, sometimes the doctor doesn't have the answer because the doctor can't see the results in your body because your body is coming back normal, right? The tests are coming back normal. So the doctor's like, well, there's nothing wrong with you, uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, I think we're taught, I think we're taught not to listen to ourselves. I think we're taught that there is an expert who will have an answer and hopefully it'll be in the form of a handy dandy pill. So yeah. it's no mess, no fuss, you know, and, 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 and that's a hard lesson to unlearn, but it is essential. And also keep, bear in mind, it seems to me, if you bear in mind the fact that they don't like the word cure, that is telling you a big something. That is telling you a big something. The, I, I hope you have all had, I mean, I hope none of you have had the experience that I've had frequently of feeling like a guinea pig. Yeah. Let's that's try this. Let's combine these things. Let's stop one. Let's up the other. Let it's like holy moly, this is my body. Yeah, it's you like know? a real circus, right? It's like <laughs> I, you don't know what they're juggling next, right? Like, let me give you three pills instead of two pills. And then oh, but let's forget that you took this pill and there might be a side effect because you took that medication. You know, uh there's no research being done. And uh for myself, Audrey, I always try to research everything. Like when I go see a doctor and the doctor says, well, we want to put you on this medication. Well, do I really need that medication? Is there something I can be doing? Can I be doing more exercise? Could I get more rest? Like, is there another way, another solution before I have to take that medication? And yeah. it's well, not one that they're going to get paid right? for. <laughs> right? <laughs> not what you're gonna get paid for. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, that's the thing, right? You're not getting paid if we don't want to take the medicine. So. Yeah. It's a push thing, right? It's a, it's kind of a, you know, like, listen to me. I, I, I got the education. I got this. I got that. Just take the pill. And I'm that, I'm that patient that says, well, let me look at the pill first. Let me do my research on the pill and let me see if it interacts with the previous medication you gave me. Because a lot of times they don't do that. They don't medication you took for years and put you on this new medication. And then it has a side effect, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, I was just going to say something, but it's gone now. Um, uh, well, anyway, yes, exactly. You, 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 you just have to know where they're coming from. And I, oh, here's what I wanted to say. I don't think the doctors are the guys that we interact with who see patients and see us sick and miserable. They, they feel our pain. And, and I believe they really want to help but they have a limited toolbox yeah. and you have the opportunity to have a whole bunch of toolboxes to explore and they don't. And the medical profession in the United States at any rate 
is very strictly controlled, very strictly controlled. You know, they'll lift your license if you if they don't like what you're prescribing or they don't like that you're prescribing something like acupuncture. Or you know, they it's very, very regulated. So they are also caught in a bind. The doctors that we see, they, they want to help and they try to help the best way they know. But um, there's a lot of controls and there's a lot of control over the education that they've had in the first place and so forth. So again, they are not bad people and they went to school forever. And it's just crazy. You come out of school after 12 years or whatever and have a limited toolbox. Yeah. It's not fair. It's not, it's not fair for anyone and particularly you if you're suffering. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I want to go back to the research because you mentioned that at the beginning of the show, Audrey, you know, research is essential. So how much research did you do for the human trial? I did years worth of research. Part of it was I, I didn't feel comfortable talking about it while my vet was still alive and vulnerable. So I, I, I so, but that's fine. It gave me plenty of time to read up on uh, all sorts of interesting scientific stuff. I have, I have some books behind me that are, are that are very inspirational to me. Um, we are electric is, is one of the titles. Um, uh, yeah, the body electric, that's an old, old tome by an MD who was very frustrated with the system because he was making these incredible discoveries about how energy moves through our body and he couldn't get research financing. He, he was so frustrated. That's another way of controlling the status quo, isn't it? Yeah. But for example, what he found was, um, say, let's just say that my, I severed my fingers by, by accident. I have a severed finger. So what happens in your electrical flows is they reverse themselves and they go to the site of the injury. And at the injury, they de-specialize cells for what is needed first, whether it's tissue or blood or bone or what is needed first. And it continues that process of de-specializing and re-specializing until the bone, the veins, the skin, it's all back together. Then the electrical flows return to normal. I mean, it, it's this guy was writing in the 50s and it's just amazing. And uh, he just couldn't get funding, could not get funding. So, Audrey, how long did the book take to write? Well, actually, I tried to write this book before I even went back. Well, let's see. I went back to school in 2000. Um, yeah, I, I soon after my dad's experience with leukemia, I tried to write this book and I sent it out to agents and houses and stuff and all i got back was just more confusion people said i like this i hate this this needs more work you know this is not click i i just couldn't make sense of it so i thought okay i need to find out more about this industry such as it is <laughs> the publishing industry <laughs> and so that's when, I, <laughs> that's when i went back to school and got my master's in writing and met lots of people in the industry and, and was exposed to all sorts of ideas. And then that, as I told you, I wrote that book to graduate, which became The Sausage Maker's Daughters. And then soon after, probably around 2014, 15, I found myself being drawn back to this subject matter. And so I started then and, and then kind of did a very deep dive uh, right before I, I, a couple of years before I published, but it was years. It was literally years and reading things about physics, reading new age physics, quote unquote, which is quantum physics, which is really, really, really what we're talking about here. Um, the quantum reality that underlies everything. Um, 
I sound like such a geek and I hardly recognize myself because <laughs> I'm now comfortable talking about this and pathology and medicine. And so, but yeah, it was, uh, it was years. It was years of research, part of it being slowed down by my vet's life and, and then, then getting very serious about it. Well, and a good book takes time to write, right? And the research is there. So, so do you feel that this book could make a good movie? You know, until I saw the movie Oppenheimer, I couldn't quite imagine it. How do you portray the quantum realm? And then I saw Oppenheimer and I went, ah, someone has figured it out. They're, they portray <laughs> with lots of loud noises and then this kind of explosive visual, they were portraying the quantum realm. So now I know it's possible. Yeah, I think the characters are, everybody can relate to these flawed characters. You know, they're, they make dumb decisions and then they pay the consequences and they run away from things they don't want to look at, but, you know, it keeps coming back. And, you know, and, the, and they, they love the wrong people and they hate the wrong people. It, it, it's so relatable. I, I just believe we all see a little bit of ourselves, at least in each one of my three main characters. And so that's compelling. And, um, and, and you know, and, and it, 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 it builds to the end, but that's not the end because I realized that I already have been working on a sequel. Um, so I'm going to take the 30s story, basically 1930s, with the backdrop of lots of stuff going on. FDR's sort of heads a lot of the, the chapter heads, like Social Security, um, the New Deal, th that kind of stuff, building up to the outbreak of World War II in September of 1939. That's when the book ends. Wow. And um, I'm taking that historical backdrop and the scientific backdrop, and then I'm going to move with a new generation of characters, a sort of multi-generational family saga continuing into the 70s. And that's another time of upheaval. Nixon is being kicked out of the White House. Vietnam is straggling its long way toward the end. A lot of protesting and upheaval in society. Um, I like those times because they add a dimension to the story. And then when we were all um, isolated with COVID, I started thinking about these microbes, which basically sort of have to be viruses because of the size. And I think, well, why wouldn't I bring it into the modern era? So at this moment in my life, I'm saying it's going to be a trilogy. And well, it'll come I, I, I can't wait to hear more on the next book and when it comes out for sure, Audrey. So, uh, okay. you know, I'm really enjoying this conversation because we're getting a lot of good education information out there. And that's what I like doing on Tea Time. Uh, so I'm going to get into your tea now. You gave me three words, and I want to know why you gave me those three words. So the three words you gave me were timely, energetic, and ambitious. Why those three words? Um, timely. Well, let's start with timely. Again, I go back to something I said. I think we all intuit that something is radically wrong with our medical system. And it is timely because it's a growing dissatisfaction. And it's partly the expense. It's partly the fact that we don't talk about cures. We have to settle with remission or some serious side effects, which may cause something else down the line. So timely, it's time. It's time. It's been 125 years since the quantum basis of reality was put forward by the great physicists of, of that era, the great physicists of quantum reality. And it's been a hundred years since these scientists were working on this exact thing and discovering how efficient and effective a vibratory healing could be, was. And so, okay, that's enough time. 
now it's time that we start spreading the word or asking the questions about what what could we use here? How could we use it here? How could it help all of us? Okay, let's see. That was word number one. <laughs> word number two, energetic. <laughs> okay, we got energetic. one, two, three. We got we got pointers here. <laughs> okay, energetic, energetic, the basis of the universe. Energetic. You know, the so the big the big bang. Think about the big bang. It was a massive explosion of energy. And as that energy was traveling out further and further and further, which it still is today, it's measurable, it starts to cool. And you know, so there's sort of either repelling of other energies around you or attraction and the attraction starts to build various aspects of the universe hydrogen carbon you know all of those things are starting to form and coalesce and you know here we are what is it 13 billion years later you know we everything you see in the universe the trees etc it's, it's all stems from that big, huge explosion of energy. So I, it's the basis of the universe, not just the basis of our bodies, not just the basis of earth. It's the basis of the universe. So everything is energy. Yeah. And your third word is ambitious. Yeah, I did touch on this too, about what an ambitious project I gave myself. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't an easy one, was it? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know if I'd recognize an easy one. Um, yeah, I had to learn about physics. I had to learn about quantum physics. I had to learn about medicine and pathology. I had to read, 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 read and study and dig deeper and consult with experts. And um, it was a very ambitious project. And I'm pleased because I, I, I believe that we accomplished to a very large degree putting in plain English what those great scientists discovered and talked about that nobody understood. <laughs> <laughs> And Audrey, I, I asked you to give me one word to describe yourself, and you gave me the word curious. And you mentioned it a little bit when you were little, you were the curious child that was always looking for stuff. So I, I was. My dad, I found a book that my dad uh, inscribed to me uh, just recently. And he was he called me his dreamer. So I just remembered my brain would catch on things, and then I would just be kind of lost in the moment, thinking about going wherever it went. And um, so, yeah, I think, I think ultimately my curiosity is what drives everything. I'm interested. I, does quantum physics sound interesting, just the name? Well, maybe not, but when you think about what it means and that everything we see is still vibrating on some level we can't see, um, you know, it, then, then it just starts to titillate me. I, I just get, you know, then I want to know more and then I have to dig deeper. And, and so um, self-education was required and then confirming all of that with some experts. And um, again, they were very generous and kind with me. So yeah, curiosity drives me. It drives I me. I like it. When I hear the word curious, I think of Curious George. The monkey that always was <laughs> looking for stuff. <laughs> so, Audrey, when I asked you what your favorite color was, you gave me purple. Why the color purple? You know, it's so interesting. Um, it's always been my favorite color. So I learned somewhere along the line that purple was the color of royalty. So maybe in my past lives. But actually, aside from that ridiculous statement, um, I, I'm just sort of attracted to the, the family of blues, you know, the sort of more blue, violet, more red, 
purple and all the shades in between. I, I, I tend to wear those colors. I, I'm, a, I'm just attracted to those colors. I don't know why. I don't know. It's, it's a vibration for sure. So I just don't know what it's telling me. <laughs> well, you never know, right? It might be some Polish royalty in the family that, you know. Uh... <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> royalty, I love that. Right. So, Audrey, what message would you like everybody to know? Your final message on uh, tonight. You know, my 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 takeaway is pretty much standard, and I I want to come back to it again and again. Nobody knows what's going on in your body as well as you, but you do have to train yourself to listen and be there, and and then you have to take responsibility, especially if you're suffering in some way, for finding the best possible way of addressing whatever you're struggling with. So I, I believe in Western medicine, but it is not the only place I go. I go to acupuncture. I go to chiropractic. I go to homeopathic. I, I explore and I talk to everybody and I, and I read. And I try to understand, I mean, now in today's world, you can Google anything and you may or may not get an accurate answer, but you'll get a million of them. And so, you know, it's um, it, it just be be aware of yourself and take responsibility and question authority and question lots of authorities. So, Audrey, if anybody wanted to reach you, how could they reach you? So they could go to my website, audreygaleauthor.com. And Audrey is A-U-D-R-E-Y. Gale is like the big win, G-A-L-E, author.com. And there's a way of reaching me there. Um, I'm also on a bunch of social media. So uh, I do post there from time to time. So, um, and, and in terms of getting the book, you can get it anywhere that books are sold. Uh, your local bookstore may not have it in stock, but they can order it. Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all of those sites have it. And it's available in um, paperback, audio, and e ebook. So, Audrey, do you have any upcoming events or book signings or anything like that? You know, um, the, the the thing that has kind of taken over in today's post-COVID world is doing a lot of stuff on the internet. And um, like, like this, these podcasts, this is so great. I don't have to be in an airport all the time. Um, and I do, on a monthly basis, do my own speaker series where I bring people from the world of electro, electromedicine, people from medicine, MDs, people from acupuncture, people from as many different specialties as I can find. And I interview them on my speaker series. And again, that information is available on AudreyGaleAuthor.com. I have taken a hiatus on the speakers because I'm trying to finish my sequel. <laughs> It's just going very slowly. <laughs> oh, and that takes time, right? <laughs> oh my God. It's going very slowly, but I I really, I really do need to focus on the sequel. So I'm, there's a hiatus, but I will resume sometime in the fall. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure having you today on Tea Time and getting to know you a little bit more and getting a good conversation and getting some good educational stuff out there. Uh, again, uh, the message today is be your own advocate and research and question authority. It's okay to ask questions, guys, uh, you know, and it's okay to get a no and a yes sometimes and look for other resources besides the medical field. There's also holistic uh, medicine out there, sound and frequencies. Check out Audrey Gale's uh, website. Uh, if you guys have any questions or any concerns, you can email me at bookingmissliz at gmail.com or check out Miss Liz's website at www.misslizesteatime.com. And we will be back tonight at 7 p.m. with the second guest. And we'll be talking about children's books and her new book as well uh, with Marie uh, Powell. And we're going to have a good conversation and serve you a new style of tea 
because Miss Liz always brings you a new TEA. And sometimes it ain't the TEA, it's three different words. And we just go down the rabbit hole and see what we can bring out and have a good conversation and connection with each and every one of us. Until then, I encourage all of you guys to keep sharing your teas, keep, be, keep being authentic and keep being yourselves. And ask yourself why and what your purpose is each and every day and look in the mirror and say it's because i matter until then i'll see you at 7 p.m eastern standard time for the second tea time of this week thank you